and welcome to Talk of Tumwa, a production of Greater Tumwa Partners in Progress. On this podcast, we'll talk about the local businesses in Tumwa to give you the backstory to their success. We'll also talk about the economic initiatives that are driving the progress of the community. And we'll talk about the issues that the community faces and much more. So stick around and let's talk of Tumwa. Welcome to Talk of Tumwa, everyone. And today we have a special guest in the studio. He's the guy that seems to be able to get everybody across town and to their doctor's appointments and uh, to whatever else it is they want to go to. The director of 1015 Transit, Jay Allison. Welcome, Jay. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's uh, my privilege to be here. Uh, First time I've ever participated in something like this. uh, So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, you know, people have been listening to it and the reaction's been great. So we're pretty happy with it so far. But to the point of why we're here today, tell us, uh, you know, 1015 is, has grown exponentially over the past several years and you have a big part in that. So uh, for those that might not be uh, really familiar with what 1015 does, Can you give us just a little bit of the backstory on 1015 Transit? Absolutely. Uh, Sometimes people just want to know what it means. Uh, It means 10 counties in Region 15 here in Southeast Iowa. So we are the public transportation provider approved by the Iowa DOT uh, for these 10 counties. It's a governmental entity, and uh, we have drivers spread out all across those 10 counties. We operate a variety of vehicles from buses to minivans to Jeeps, uh, some Buicks, some oddball vehicles, with uh, the sole purpose in moving people uh, wherever they need to go. So how many uh, vehicles do you actually have in your fleet? Because you drive by there and there are a lot of vehicles there, be it buses or or other cars. A rough guess, I'm going to say 120, maybe. Wow. Right now, we're, we're struggling a little bit. As many vehicles as I have, I still don't have enough. Uh, when one breaks down, uh, you know, if we don't have backups, then that puts the pressure on us. Uh, getting parts is extremely difficult right now with all that's happened through COVID. Uh, we are ordering four brand new minivans um, now. I'm looking at ordering a bus. I'd love to order another 20. I've got five new Jeeps on order, so... Again, um, we've got some stuff in the makings, but boy, we could sure use them today. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that seems to be a common problem across this country right now. So uh, you have um, a lot of service lines that you're offering, uh, doing folks that have disabilities. Uh, you do veterans. Uh, you do the people that just plain don't have transportation on their own. What is your primary focus group as far as as transporting? Primary focus group, anybody that is alive and needs a ride. (laughs) Let's say it that way. Um, Again, we do offer a variety of services, uh, as you mentioned there, uh, also uh, senior program. uh, So those are 60 and above. That's an application process that qualifies them for that. But um, it could just be uh, a child. You know, um, need to go to grandma's or um, a senior going to the grocery store, doctor's appointments, uh, whatever the purpose is, uh, our job is to try to facilitate that and get them to their destination. We do once in a while some uh, uh, outside of the box kind of stuff, maybe uh, a little different. Uh, We do runs to Des Moines and Iowa City for medical, which uh, is part of our everyday. But we also do uh, zoo trips, a group... uh, could be a big family. It could be like a reunion, something. Uh, and they'll call us and say, hey, we got 30 people want to go to the zoo. So we do trips like that, too. Okay. So just so a variety of stuff. Now, uh, we had a conversation not too long ago, and you spoke uh, very specifically about a grant that you had in place for veterans. Can you talk just a little bit about that? What we're working on for veterans is to provide free transportation. What we did, we ran an internal pilot program. The uh, 1050 Transit Board set aside $25,000 of internal money to run this program for a year. Uh, We ran it at reduced rates just to kind of see what it would look like. And after that first year, we had spent uh, a little over $27,000. So we are in the project process right now 
of starting a 501c3 entity that would allow us to do fundraising to help help offset these costs. Because what we've learned as we've rolled this program out is some of our VA um, offices that used to provide transportation are turning all that over to us. Again, because that's what we do um, on a daily basis is transport people. And so it helps them financially, saves the cost and the responsibility there as we as we pick it up and we provide that transportation. We've got a few individuals working on trying to help with, with some finances there. Uh, nothing has come through yet. Uh, we're still optimistic. But uh, with that being said, we just feel the urgency to get out there on our own and do what we can to raise the money. It's a desperate need. You know, when you got a veteran that needs to get to an appointment and doesn't have a ride, we, we're just trying to make sure we can get some finances there to help that. Sure. Now, going back to the growth, uh, you, you folks uh, saw some v- exponential growth here a couple of years ago with uh, absorbing the Ottumwa Transit Authority for very particular reasons from the city's side of the, the coin. Would you mind going into a little bit of detail about how that transaction happened? Sure. Um, you know, we left the city, uh, what have been January 1 of 14, is when 1015 became its really uh, own entity. At that time, we were all city employees, and 1015 was administered by the city. So when we went out on our own, um, we um, we was about probably 30 people. Uh, today, we're pushing probably 94 people. So we've grown considerably. In the process, um, part of it is uh, catching the wave and riding it at the right time. Timing is everything. And when I took over, um, we only had one minivan in our fleet, and they were all buses. And so I started bringing in vans, and when you're running one person, Iowa City, in Des Moines uh, in a van, you're saving a lot of money versus the bus at six miles to the gallon. And it's a better ride. So we caught that wave, we rode it, and then we transitioned the next one into bringing into uh, sedans or little SUVs, again, for the sole purpose of keeping our buses and our vans available for those riders with disabilities so that that, that vehicle is always available for them. Uh, in doing that, again, uh, transportation, our, our, our demand just keeps going up and up. Um, then we had a uh, situation where we was trying to figure out how to to work best with uh, the city and providing transportation they need here in Ottumwa alongside uh, Ottumwa Transit. Through that process, um, it ended up uh, coming back to us. The original uh, plan was that we would stop transporting in Ottumwa and allow them to transport all the needs of Ottumwa. But again, my infrastructure of drivers by that time was uh, uh, much greater and the need was there. And so uh, through that process, um, they end up asking us to come back to Ottumwa and we worked out the details. And so July 1 of 2020, we absorbed the fixed route system here in Ottumwa. Uh, We have purchased uh, brand new buses. We spent out over $2 million in in new buses for the city. Uh, We're having a struggle with them. the air ride systems they put under them are not uh, up to what I would think they should be. And so we are literally stripping them out and going to put a new system under them to keep the buses on the road. Hate to say that with a brand new bus, but it has been a very tough go with these brand new buses. Uh, But with that being said, um, it um, was not necessarily... A struggle. It was just an, a little bit of adjustment for us. Uh, we have one little fixed route we run in Oskaloosa three days a week. Uh, of course, when I started, I started with the city, and so I was very familiar. I was a driver. That's how I started with the company, part-time driver. Um, and so for us, uh, it, it's what we did. And so uh, again, there was it, we went from one day, uh, Tom Transit, next day to us. Uh, and uh, it's, it's been going good since. Uh, every once in a while, we might hit a, a little situation, a little bump. We figured it out and keep moving forward. Uh, but overall, it's going good. Ridership's starting to come back up. You know, now we're got, you know, we've gotten through COVID, and uh, ridership is starting to come back up, and uh, we're hearing good things about the route. 
Yeah, you did that merge right at the perfect time. Uh, July of 2020 was not exactly the best time to be doing mergers. It was not. What are the hours of operation? I know you're not a 24-hour service. Easiest way to answer that is uh, give us a call and see what the availability is. Now, our fixed routes in Otomo, they start at about 6.45 and run till almost 6 p.m. for the five bus line system. But our demand response, which would be the 1015 side, is it is really based on driver availability. And what I mean by that is if we've got uh, our driver starting at 7 o'clock in the morning and you call in and you need a 630, you're going to get it. Now, if our driver's starting at 7 o'clock and you call in and you need a 2 a.m., uh, depends on what the trip is. If it's just a local trip, we're probably not going to commit to it because then I have a huge gap there that I got to pay a driver to set. So that's kind of why it's based on availability. Um, our average times are probably somewhere around 5 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's kind okay. of the general area of time. But again, it all does fluctuate uh, depending on the day and, de- and depending on the drivers and their start times. Uh, once in a while, we'll get an early trip. Uh, maybe needs to go to the Mayo Clinic. They got to be there at eight o'clock you know so that that might be like a 2 a.m pickup so again all that stuff is kind of looked at individually Uh, if it's a big trip if it's a small trip then we look to attach it to something close okay well the economy has uh, been an issue that a lot of businesses have been talking about lately and since you're in the transportation game the gas prices are probably hitting you uh, fairly hard right now how is it that you mitigate some of that rising cost with with what uh, really is the biggest share of what your operating expense probably is? This is um, the highest we've ever seen gas prices. I mean, we're we're pushing four dollars plus. We uh, have a diesel in our fleet. The other day we filled it. I think it was five dollars plus. We don't uh, have the ability to raise our rates per se. If we raise our rates, even one penny, you know, we would have to go through public hearings and all that. So, so the key is to run the, the transportation as efficient as we can. So that's why the smaller vehicles have really helped us offset that. Uh, if we can ride multiple people together, you know, let's say we got two people going to Iowa City and they both have a nine o'clock appointment. One of them is in Atama, one is in Fairfield. We're going to run those two people together instead of single. So, so we look at ways like that to kind of okay. save through that process. It'd be nice to say that uh, there was other avenues there for, to grab some extra money, but uh, no, we just got to make it work the best we can. Along those lines, though, um, have you seen, you mentioned that your ridership's going up. Have you seen any recent spikes because of the uh, fuel prices? Sometimes we don't know why an individual will ride with us, but we're starting to think that could be part of it, uh, especially if you're talking local trips and things like that. Uh, you can jump on for $2, you know, and get a demand response. Better yet, you can jump on the fixed route bus for a dollar. Mm-hmm. And that's a whole lot cheaper than $4 plus a gallon in fuel. So I think that could be adding a little bit to it. If you are going to Des Moines or Iowa City, and you have uh, Title 19 or Medicaid, you know, that's going to cover your ride. So, I mean, that makes that a little more attractive uh, instead of the fuel cost for that trip if you take your own vehicle. So I'm thinking those things are starting to maybe get people to, to look a little bit closer at public transit and how it can serve them. And, you know, that's why we're here is yeah. to serve the general public. And quite honestly, it's, a, it's fairly green uh, having, you know, multiple people ride sharing as opposing to 15 people taking their own cars. Absolutely. We have um, a couple, we have three different locations right now that we transport uh, workers to for that same reason. Uh, we transport to Sigourney up to Bender Foundry. We transport to Mid-States down in uh, Milton. And we transport over to Iowa Aluminum in Albia okay. um, Monday through Friday on those. And, and that's just moving workers. Again, a lot more efficient, you know, if you can catch a ride. So, Yeah, so if there are any companies out there that would want to take advantage of that, I'm sure your, your telephone We're line is open. We're always listening, yes. <laughs> 
so the people that are that are people that are wanting to get onto uh, one of your buses, where at in town can they actually go to get onto them? Because they, you know, we've switched around a little bit here in the city of Atumwa over the years. So, uh, you know, what some people the last time they may have ridden a bus, that place doesn't exist anymore. So where is it that people can actually get onto the buses? The nice thing about the way we operate the fixture out bus systems is what you call a flag stops, basically. You don't have to be at a specific spot on the route. You just have to be on the route. So wherever the bus is at coming down the road, if you're on the right side, means the passenger side of the bus, and you just flag that bus, you can jump on wherever it's at. That's a little bit of a change. So it's a good it it's be. a good change. Uh, uh, if... Uh, Again, uh, we operate the Oski, Oski rides like that, uh, the route we operate up there, and it makes it flexible for the rider because you're not looking for that specific spot you have to be on. So let's say you're walking down the road, and all of a sudden you just don't want to walk anymore, and here comes a bus. Just flag it, jump on. Okay. Uh, you can buy a unlimited monthly pass. Uh, you can buy those at South hy North hy You can buy it at our office downtown here on Main Street. You can buy it over on our office at Madison. And then that even reduces it. So it's even more reduced if you buy a monthly unlimited ride pass. Okay. So where can the guy like me who wants to know where those routes are, so when I am walking and I get tired and just decide I want to ride, how do I know where those routes are at? You can jump on the Facebook page. Uh, We have the Atoma Rides Facebook page, and it has the times, the map, everything there for you. You could call us. we could mail you a hard copied map, or if you want to stop in one of our locations there on Maine or Madison, we can give you a map. So what's the future look like for 1015? Yeah, you guys have made a pretty big uh, footprint for yourselves. Uh, how, how do you envision the next two years, five years? That's an interesting question. Uh, probably for myself, the next biggest object to tackle is probably going to be electric vehicles. We're we're getting a lot of feedback from the state, uh, from the federal government to be looking into it. Uh, So that'll be the next probably learning curve that we have to tackle is to start pursuing electric vehicles. Uh, We're not opposed to it. It's just a little bit out of our wheelhouse, you know, when you're going from everything we have in our fleet being um, gasoline with the exception of the diesel to an all-electric vehicle, it maybe could be a little dawning, uh, but but we're up for the challenge. So we're kind of excited about starting to look into it. If they was to come out with uh, an opportunity that, hey, we could get it tomorrow, we, we'd go for it. So, so we're looking forward to it. Now, will you have, I'm assuming, some infrastructural costs associated with going electric with charging stations, things Absolutely. like that? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, I've started kind of my first initial digging around a little bit. Uh, but it looks like we'll put in some kind of uh, charging stations. And again, what that looks like, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we do have, um, as we've grown, we have acquired some area down there on Madison, some property. Uh, so we're kind of preparing for, I guess, that, that future growth in a new direction. Okay. Now, do you anticipate that some of those um, electric vehicles will be able to stay on the road as long with you know actually driving as the gas powered vehicles or will they have to return back to home to charge a little bit more often? I don't necessarily have the answer for that yet. Um, The way our route is designed in a perfect world, we would actually have 10 vehicles that would run those fixed routes. So it's kind of an eight hour and a four hour shift. If you think about it in that way, the odds of possibly running that vehicle for the eight hours might be doable To run a a bus 12 hours, I'm not sure it'll make that. So, again, I got a lot of work to do there and study on that. Well, it's actually pretty exciting in my mind because uh, you don't hear about a lot of communities having electric uh, public transportation. So, you know, looking at the the green movement, uh, I think that this is a great direction to go for our community. Well, I'm sure thinking it could be, especially at $4 plus a gallon. (laughs) Exactly. And who knows if it's going to stop at $4 a gallon. It sure doesn't look like it. Correct. That's right. (laughs) You know, uh, if we could figure out how to uh, use uh, water, you know, in place of uh, gasoline, we'd be okay. Yeah. But as uh, fuel prices continue to rise, it definitely is putting a strain on us a little bit. 
how many miles do you figure that that your vehicles are actually going on the road every year? Mm, million plus. Wow. Um, I have a driver over in one of my western counties. They probably put on that one single driver has put on more than 50,000 miles in one year. So if you think about that, you know, the average individual running 12 to 15,000, we're running in one year's time what a normal vehicle might run in four years. So your employees, uh, uh, you said you had 94 employees that, that are working for 1015 Transit. Are you done growing uh, as far as your employee base goes? I don't think so. Um, that is something we're looking at right now is um, what does the growth look like if we, you know, break the 100 barrier? Uh, do we want to grow that big? Do we want to kind of maintain where we're at? So those are questions that, that I, you know, I'm trying to answer on a daily basis. We have uh, different classifications of drivers. You know, we have, uh, uh, we have sedan drivers, we have minivan drivers, we have CDL licensed bus drivers. We have three different classifications there. We have part-time and full-time drivers. So again, over the years, we have developed uh, uh, quite a, a variety of options uh, where we're looking at when we bring somebody on. What is something uh, unique or interesting about 1015 that you think people should know about? Uh, I guess uh, we love what we do. I mean, love to get up in the morning and go to work <laughs> and get somebody where they want to go, you know? Um, no, that's a great question, Mark. I, I'm not, you kind of caught me off guard with that one. Threw me a little curveball on that. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I might have to think about that one. Okay. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I really appreciate about 1015 Transit um, is is the fact that you do a great job of servicing uh, people with disabilities, uh, veterans, um, people that are living in the retirement communities, people that have uh, special needs through medical care. Uh, I, I personally find that a huge benefit to our community because there there are a lot of communities that just don't have that. So I, I think that that's something that, that we should take uh, great pride in in the community that we do have that service. And uh, the fact that uh, we do have a fairly spread out community, uh, there, is a, there is a good need and desire to have public transit in place. So if anybody's out walking around and they're just plain tired, uh, make sure to check out those bus routes. And, and can you remind us one more time, Jay, uh, where they can find the information for your bus routes? You can, uh, you can go to the 1015 website. Uh, that's at least a point of contact, you know. Um, but we have a Facebook page out there, and that's probably going to give you what you need. It's got the maps and the timetables and all that on there. Well, for those of you who have not uh, been like myself, who have not been on public transit for a while, I would encourage you to, to uh, take an afternoon and get out and ride the bus. They're brand new buses, a lot of them. So get out there and, and just uh, enjoy a leisurely stroll across town, if nothing else. Jay, thanks for coming in today. And uh, I, I wish your business the most success. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. You All have right. a great day. Thanks, everyone, for listening to Talk of Tumwin. Stay tuned for next week's episode.